just looking at Revelation chapter 4, uh, this is when John, uh, he's verse 1, After this I looked, behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the voice uh, which I had heard speaking behind me that sounded like a mighty trumpet said to me, Come up here, and I'm going to show you what's going to take place. And at once I was taken up in the spirit, behold, I saw the throne. It goes on, and specifically I want to move um, to verse 7. Okay, well, verse 6 talks about around the throne there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature uh, like an ox. The third living creature had the face of a man, and the fourth living creature the face of an eagle. Mm. Okay. And, and so, what I want to look at in starting and opening up tonight, um, we're not going to go and look at the throne chariot description in detail, because as I look through it, there's a lot of information, a lot of head knowledge, but I couldn't see a lot that I could apply for life application, mm -hmm. apart from understanding the chariot fiery throne of God. Um, one thing I do want to note is in Ezekiel 1, there are some differences with the description of the cherubim in Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4. Um, this is not that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Whenever you see this, it's not a contradiction. It's actually there is a spiritual intentional reason why there is a difference. Okay? And so in Ezekiel 1 with the throne chariot, Next to the cherubim, there are these wheels within wheels. And those wheels within wheels have eyes all around them. Okay? And the spirit of the cherubim is in the wheels. So, if your spirit is in something, it's you. Okay? It's not different to you. If your spirit is in something, it's connected to you. The Spirit of God is in them, and they're, they're one with God, but their spirit is within the wheels, and they're one with the wheels. And the wheels have eyes all around them, and the cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 1 don't have eyes all around them. But the cherubim in Revelation 4 have eyes all around them. And so what this is doing is it's showing the connection between the oneness of the wheels and the cherubim so the description of the cherubim is a combined description of the wheels and the cherubim. They have eyes all around them. And that simply means omniscient, uh, seen in all directions. Now obviously they don't know all things as God knows all things, but they definitely can see all things from any angle. And can you imagine they've got a face to the front, a face to the left, a face to the right, a face behind, and they've got eyes all over them. You can't really creep up behind these guys and surprise them. Because, <laughs> like, like, really, um, there was actually a, a, a TV series that was made back in the 90s and um, at the, the end of time and stuff like that. And they actually have a cherubim in it with, I don't know if you've heard of the X-Files. It, it had a cherubim appear in one of the X-Files. And the cherubim was eyes all over it with all these wings and everything. It looked pretty... Like they, these guys studied the Bible to get that cherubim in the storyline. Um, so I just wanted to make that mention. There is a, there's a strong connection. The description of the cherubim and the throne chariot of Ezekiel chapter 1, Revelation chapter 4, except Revelation 4 is actually combining a lot of the pictures there. Um, now, the order of the faces is different. This is also intentional. Okay. So the order of the faces in Revelation chapter 4 is that you have first the lion, and this is what I went through with you last week in regards to the Gospels. So you've got first the lion, and the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah, and that is how Jesus is represented in the book of Matthew. Okay? Then you've got the face of the ox, and that's how Jesus is represented in the book of Mark. Uh, the ox represents the suffering servant. The ox represents the sacrifice. And that's an important point that I'm going to get to very soon. Okay? So the ox is a suffering servant. It's the sacrifice. It's also the, the one that, that is works hard. Mm. So Mark is an action man book. Mm. He's doing the work. It's not all about teaching. 
It's not about prophesying, it's about action. So Mark is full of the works of Jesus, the acts of Jesus. It's all the stories of Jesus healing the sick and everything. Not a lot of teaching from Jesus, it's more his activities. And so that's the ox. And then uh, the face of the man is Luke. Mm -hmm. and, and so the face of the man, and Jesus is the son of man revealed in Luke. And it's revealing... Uh, the humanity of Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus, and it's really, like I said, the Matthew is revealing the apostolic lion, and Mark is the evangelist, and Luke is the pastor and the teacher, and he's revealing, you know, it comes alongside Jesus is very pastoral, he's his compassion on the people, his caring for the people. But the teacher, Mark, has more of the parables and the teachings of Jesus recorded than any other of the Gospels. And then finally, the face of the eagle, which is the prophetic, the God perspective of things, how God sees things, and also revealing the deity, the, the Son of God part of Jesus, is the Gospel of John. Okay? Now that's according to the order... That is in the book of Revelation. The problem is, and this is where throughout church history, there has been uh, different of the early church fathers, Augustine and Origen and a lot of the early church fathers, uh, they had a division or a disagreement of what the four faces represented in regards to the Gospels. When I was younger in the Lord, and in fact I was doing the teaching, and I didn't realize that the four faces were in, an, in a different order between Ezekiel 1 and Revelation. And so I'd sometimes get confused because I knew the order of you know the lion, the ox, the man, the eagle. And then I was teaching out of Ezekiel 1 one day and I got confused because it, it wasn't all the same. And I, and I wasn't registering why. Well, it's because it's different. So the order in Ezekiel is first the face of the man, then the face of the lion, then the face of the ox, then the face of the eagle. Mm -hmm. So, um, obviously, no, no um, disagreement about John being the face of the eagle, the prophetic, the divine, Jesus, the Son of God, that, that revelation, um, both have that. So in ch church history... They were all saying, no, 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 the, the face of the man is Matthew, the face of the lion is Mark, the face of the ox is Luke, and the face of the eagle is John. No, 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 the face of the lion is Matthew, and it went back and forth. Okay, so tonight, I'm going to let you know the revelation. As I was really meditating, why? Asking God why? Because whenever in Scripture there is something that is like this, mm -hmm. it's intentional in God, mm -hmm. and there's intentional reasons God does it and we can end up getting two camps that argue with each other and we're both wrong and we're both right mm. so I want you to know both camps are right and both mm. camps are wrong mm. they're right in their perspective of the order of mm. what face represents what gospel they're both right and they're both wrong in saying the other camp is wrong mm. there you go so I'll tell you I'll explain this why Okay, so uh, the symbol of the lion and the Messiah as the, the lion of the tribe of Judah aligned with, because Matthew is dealing with a lot of prophecy about the Messiah, Messianic prophecy, and really revealing, um, Matthew was originally written to the Messianic Jews and the Jewish people, revealing Jesus as the Messiah. And so that's a, a very key. But the thing is, the Messiah is the anointed man. And so the face of the man is, is legitimate because it shows there is a man who has been anointed by God. And because he has that anointing, now he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has a lion anointing. There's a man and the anointing has made the man more than a man. Okay? And so revealing uh, the, a human being... That is anointed of God, and the word anointing me is Messiah. In English, from Mashika uh, in the actual Hebrew, the anointed man, the Messiah, is the line of the tribe of Judah. And so there's both concepts in there. 
Okay, Mark. Now this is interesting because uh, a, a number of people, they see the ox representing the evangelist, but the, the, the symbol of the lion is often given for an evangelist as well because they're going out. They're hunting for souls. Uh, they are also carrying the, the line of Judah's boldness and courage. They're, they're known as action people, as a, as a line going out to hunt for the prey, spiritual warfare, going out to hunt for souls, etc. And so there is actually that combination. An evangelist carries a lion likeness. And they're very much known as the the action men, they're the ones that are bold and courageous and even forceful and aggressive in how they present the gospel. But then the ox is showing, well, they're the ones that they constantly, they work at it. They're very practical. They're not all heavenly minded. They're really focusing on people and they have to endure till the end. And there's a lot of sacrifice in that ministry required. And by the way, I'll get to this later. I'll say it now. The ox is a symbol of the sacrifice. It's also a symbol of priestly ministry. The, the lion is a symbol of kingly ministry. Mm. The ox and the lamb. So I'm, gonna, I'm giving you a big hint here. They're symbols of priestly ministry. Because the priests bring the sacrifices. Okay? So Luke, as the face of the man, the pastor, teacher, showing the humanity of Christ, his compassion uh, to men, coming alongside men, teaching men, pastoring men, etc. But if you're involved with any sort of pastoral ministry, and you're involved in teaching ministry, you've got to be like the ox. Mm. Especially pastoral ministry, because... People, if you want to be successful in pastoral ministry, you don't just do one year, walk away and go to another church. You've got to be in there long term, mm -hmm. working with people long term. And it's often, a, they say you don't ever have kids, you don't have babies, you have people. When you're a parent, right? Because you've got to be there, you hang around them their whole life. And you know, when they're 30, 40 years old, you're still looking after them. That dynamic, you still care about them, they're still your kids. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the same that there is this thing that you need to be enduring when you're working with people. You have to suffer long because um, they're not maybe where you hope that they would be or where you want them to be and they go forward, three steps forward, two steps back or whatever. It's some backslide and then you've got to go out and you've got to find some them. Some people one step forward, <laughs> five steps back. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, praise God, there's, there's three steps forward and two steps back for people as well and, and I was one of them. But anyway, but so do you see how that's all coming in? The, the past, so what's happening is like a, the faces and what they represent coming into the different fivefold ministries. A teacher, you know, to be a really good teacher, um, I've been a Christian now for 35 years. I have been studying the Word for that long. I have been preaching. Originally, I started as a preacher. You don't start as a teacher. Because you don't really know enough to teach, you've got to, you're preaching stuff. And um, I went to Bible college. I did, you know, Bible translation. I had to look at Greek, and now I'm looking at Hebrew. And and there is the ox likeness. You've got to really plow the ground. You've got to dig in deep. And you've got to um, endure in the Word to actually come to a place of maturity that you can actually teach the Word. Mm -hmm. And and um, and so. There is that ox likeness that you need the humanity, the compassion, that I'm not looking down on others, I'm identifying with others. I have, you know, compassion literally from the, the Latin means that you suffer together with. You, mm -hmm. you understand their suffering, you understand their struggle. It's my struggle even. Um, it becomes my struggle. But that ox likeness, pastors and teachers, without that, you will not be fruitful, you will not have harvest. And you've got to study through the Word and spend hours in it. And then you've got to draw from that to bring a harvest of the Word, etc. Okay. And obviously the evangelist with the harvest of souls, with the ox. And so we know the eagle, uh, God's viewpoint, God's perspective, etc. 
and uh, that's that's the same in both lists. So as we go through the teaching, I'm going to be breaking up the four faces of God dynamic, and I call it the four faces of God. The cherubim are revealing God; they are His representatives, and they are revealing God, and they're revealing the the nature of God. And the one who has the fullness of the image of God is Jesus. And so the, the four cherubim aren't revealing the image of God in perfection. Only Jesus does that. And that's why they're actually revealing the perfect servant of God, the perfect throne guardian, representative of God, is actually Jesus Christ. Not angels. But angels have a like Jesus ministry. Just like we're not Jesus... We're not God's image in perfection, but we are created in His image to bear His image, to reveal His image. That's a little bit of what it means, arise, shine, for His light has come and His glory is upon you. That we're actually, it's because of His arising on us and His shining on us that we can reveal any glory. It's not actually us, it's Him. Um, so if you understand all of this, God has four faces. Because Jesus is the perfect image of God. So God has a lion-like face, an ox-like face, a man-like face, an eagle-like face. It's all part of the character and nature of God. Mm -hmm. And that's seen in the cherubim. And that's seen ultimately in Jesus. And it's an example for Ezekiel. How God is calling Ezekiel to live as his representative messenger. As his prophetic messenger, the one that's going to represent him to the people and also for you and I. We are to be. So we're going to go into a study of looking at these different faces biblically, their characteristics, their attributes that every Christian is called into. And God is like this. Okay. Um, and then if I have time tonight, I'll tell you how Satan is like this. Okay. Mm. Because Satan, uh, we are told, as a, he was a guardian cherubim. Ezekiel 28 verse 14, Lucifer was created perfect as a guardian cherubim. A throne guardian. And he was created like that, perfect in wisdom, until pride was found in him. And now he is a fallen image of God. Mm -hmm. And not just he's a counterfeit image of God. He's a twisted image of God. And so uh, as we go through the study, we see that the line is not just a representation of Jesus. The line is a representation of Satan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And uh, we'll also see that the not so much ox, but the bull, which is the, the uncastrated wild mm. bull mm. that has not been broken in and will not yield and surrender, which represents the unbroken flesh nature, that's Satan. And that's our mm. flesh. So our flesh can be like the negative picture, the lion-like characteristics in the negative, and also the, the yes. unbroken bull that, you know, mm. his hormones and his testosterone and his flesh leads him. That's his guide. It's not the Spirit of God. He goes where... His hormones leave him and he's wild and he won't submit to anyone. He's not broken in. He wants my will. Mm. That's what it is. Mm. And then we also see the picture of the man. We know the fallen man in, created in God's image mm -hmm. or man in his fallen sinful nature. Mm. Um, and then finally, the prophetic. There is obviously a true prophetic that comes from God, mm. that represents God. And dreams and visions and spiritual experiences in the spirit of God, from God. And then there's also foul, unclean spirits, deceiving spirits, false prophetic. Okay. So let's go back into our study. Go to Revelation chapter 5. We'll start with verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll. It was written within and on the back. 
It was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong and mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? No one in heaven or on earth or even under the earth was able to open the scroll, even look into it. So I began to weep loudly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to even look into it. Then one of the 24 elders, he came over to me and he said, Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and even amongst the elders, I suddenly saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that are sent out throughout the whole earth. And he took the scroll from the right hand of God. Okay, so I'm not focusing on the scroll and all that stuff. I want to focus on this revelation of Jesus. And uh, he's the one that's worthy to break the seals and open the scroll and to loosen the, the vision and the purposes of God in the earth. God's original intention in creation, he's got the authority now to bring it to its fullness. And that's what it's talking about and the activities that are needed to do that. So he's worthy and he's introduced as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So the Lion of the tribe of Judah, going back to Genesis, is a messianic title. So it's understood right there with Jacob's blessing over Judah that uh, there is this lion-like one that would arise from the loins of Judah, from, from the tribe of Judah. And uh, this one, he would hold the scepter. We're going to look at that scripture soon. Uh, it goes on, the root of David, and that's more specifically now we see in the unraveling of the messianic prophecies or as the Messianic prophecies started, they were general. And so you've got even back into Genesis with, you know, the seed of the woman crushing the serpent's head. That was a Messianic prophecy. Very general. He's going to come out of humanity, the seed of the woman. He's going to be a human being. Then we get something even more specific later. We find out he'll come from the loins of Abraham and all the nations in him will be blessed. And now more specifically, he'll come from the tribe of Judah. Now it gets even more specific as the Old Testament rolls on and, and it's called um, progressive revelation. As you study the Old Testament, as it rolls on, the revelation becomes more specific and more clear. Okay, And so we see that he will be a son of David. He's going to not just be from the tribe of Judah. He's going to be a son of David. And David's line will, is, the, is the Messianic line. So it's the Davidic Messianic line. And so one of his Messianic titles is he's the root of David, which means the offspring of David. Now he has conquered, and so he has now got authority to open the scroll and break its seals. So around the throne, the four living creatures and all the elders, and suddenly the line of the tribe of Judah appears, not as a lion, but as a lamb. So everyone's expecting to see this huge, ferocious lion conquering, victorious, and suddenly this lamb comes out. And so there's a revelation of how the Messiah conquered through the cross. And it comes as a lamb, and this lamb looks like he's been slain. And it's got seven horns, which speaks of perfect power and authority, and seven eyes, which has got the seven spirits of God. He's, he's got perfect uh, wisdom, etc., and understanding. So... If we understand that, throughout the Old Testament, there's prophecies of the Messiah. He will be a courageous, lion-like king, victorious and devouring his enemies. But we also have the suffering servant. And uh, we have the, the symbol of the sacrifice that takes away the sin, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And all these symbols in the Old Testament. But he is both. Okay, so that's why, um, you know, the ox as a symbol of sacrifice and the priesthood and the lion as the symbol of the kings, the king priest. We're told that later on. Revelation chapter 5 tells us he's worthy and now he's purchased us by his blood and we become kings and priests. 
of the, the Lord. And we rule and reign, uh, we minister to God as priests, and we rule and reign as kings. And that's a theme because the Messiah is a king priest. And more than that, he's not just the priest, he's the sacrifice. Okay, so as we look at all of those symbols, then we start to understand the different combinations of the faces of God. His humanity in coming, but the, he's the, the lion-like one. Uh, he is the suffering servant, the sacrifice, but he is a lion. And uh, it's also said his first coming, the primary mission was to reveal the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The primary mission was to go to the cross, bear the sins of humanity, pay the price for our salvation and our redemption for eternal life. But his second coming, he's not coming back as the Lamb, he comes back as the Lion. And so as we do our study on the lion-like nature of the Lord, which means the church is called to have a lamb-like nature and a lion-like nature. Mm -hmm. And then we've got to know when we're to be the lamb and when we're to be the lion. you know, And when we're to be turning the other cheek or when we're to be courageously confronting mm -hmm. something. So don't get it mixed up. You don't, confront, you know, don't turn the other cheek to the devil and let him do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. And don't courageously confront and uh, attack people that need healing you know uh, we need a wisdom from god what face do we show in any given situation and sometimes you've got to stop and say you know i'm a natural lion but god jesus isn't always the lion he wants to come as a as a pastor shepherd he wants to come as a compassionate one and so i've got to learn to step out of who i am in my flesh and now I've got to step into who Jesus is. I've got to step into the Spirit. And I've got to be like Jesus to this person, even though this is not who I am naturally. And so that's part of why we're doing this study, is because all of us have different personalities, and all of us will tend towards certain attributes of one of the faces more than the others. Um, but you don't say, well, because, you know, I'm a lion, I'm always going to just devour everybody. You know, like even the weak people that are all suffering I'm just going to devour them as well you know or no I'm just always gentle I can't attack anybody you know Jesus says love your enemy so I'm just going to go and you know I'm going to love the devil and love love what he does and you know no one really says that but they act like that mm. you know what I'm saying I'm going to love ungodly agendas I'm going to love those people I'm going to let them keep doing what they're doing okay so let's go to Genesis this is the first appearance of the Messiah as a lion-like one, but also the tribe of Judah as the lion of Judah tribe. In fact, in the days of Moses, God ordained that there be four banners, and the twelve tribes of Israel were broken up into three, sorry, into four groups of three. And so there's one that would lead the way, and Judah leads the way. Right from back there, you know, Benjamin was the, the first king, came out of Benjamin, that's Saul, but it was never God's prophetic intention. God's prophetic intention was always that the kingly line, the messianic line, would come from Judah. So even back in the days of Moses, Judah goes first, and they lead the other two tribes, and then to the left and to the right of the tabernacle and the priesthood carrying, there's the other three tribes on each side, and there's three tribes at the back. And so you get this picture of the tribes are like this, going through the wilderness with the tabernacle in the middle, the priesthood in the middle, and the banner of Judah that leads the first three tribes is the lion. So it talks about that uh, in, the, in the Pentateuch. And... Um, so let's go back now, Genesis chapter 49. Now I pray that God's going to give you some revelation, not just about who Jesus is, about, about who you are and who we are as the church out of this. I'll, I'll give you a... I'll, I'll say it up front, so as I go through the storyline, you're going to catch where I'm going with this, you know. So I'm not going to let you drag on and let you read the. I'm going to let you read the end of the story so you can find out what's going on, and then you go back, okay? So listen to this. If 
Jesus is the line of the tribe of Judah. Jesus literally, his flesh and blood genealogy comes from Judah. Judah, you know, and uh, obviously from God in heaven, um, but also from Judah. So he's from the tribe of Judah. He's from the Davidic messianic tribe. We know that, but Jesus. Now we are grafted in to God's redemptive people and God's redemptive purpose through Jesus, right? So here is my deeply studied opinion. We are of the tribe of Judah. Okay? Because Jesus is of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is our king. And we are grafted into God's redemptive people and purpose through Jesus, which means we are, just like people say we're spiritual Israel, there's a natural Israel and there's a spiritual Israel. And I actually don't have a problem with that terminology. Some people do. I don't. Um, because we're looking through the study of First Peter and everything God ever said over Israel, Peter's saying over the church. Um, but more than that, more specifically than that, we are of the Messianic Davidic tribe. We are the lines of the tribe of Judah. That is our new creation, born again destiny. And the interesting thing, we're also of the Melchizedek order of priests. We're not Levites. Okay? None of us are Levites. The Levites was a tribe in Israel and probably is still a tribe in Israel. It's a lineage in the flesh. We're not after the flesh. We're after the Spirit, Christ, in us. And so Melchizedek, that revelation was given to David before Hebrews was written. David understood the Melchizedek priesthood. Therefore, David understood even as he wasn't from the tribe of Levi, he was from the tribe of Judah, which is the tribe of praise. And so he establishes the tabernacle of David, and he establishes a foretype of the Melchizedek order that we walk in today. And he prophesied, because he had revelation, that there is a priestly order that is higher than the Levitical priestly order. And David actually moved as someone, and this is what the book of Hebrews said, David moved in a high priestly order, even though he was from Judah, not from Levi. So too with us, so too with Jesus, who is not from Levi. He is the high priest of the Melchizedek order, and he's from the tribe of Judah. And that's why praise is such a central focus such a central power source for us. It is, I believe, as we praise the Lord, our roar. Okay? And so, again, as we look through all the different faces, there's all sorts of connections into our messianic identity. Okay? As Christ is, so we are called to be. Okay? So again, sorry I'm taking my time to get into this, but once I've said that, then you start to look at this, and you're, this is prophecy over you. This is prophecy over the church. Our God-given identity as we are in the Davidic Messiah from the tribe of Judah, Jesus. Okay? So, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 49 Verse 9. Let's start with verse 8. Okay, so this is where Jacob is blessing his 12 sons. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Now in the Hebrew, this is wordplay. Because Judah is Yahuda, praise is Yahuda. Okay? So Yahuda, your brothers shall Yahuda you. Okay? Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Remember that messianic, the first messianic word that you'll, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. Mm -hmm. Now more specifically, the Messiah, he crushes the serpent head, serpent's head, 
And we're told in Romans, the God of peace will soon crush the serpent's head under our feet. So you can see that prophetically and biblically, what is said over Jesus it's, said, uh, it's promised prophetically for us as the people of God. Now again, it doesn't mean that we automatically move into it. That we've got to move into it by faith and obedience. We have to align ourselves. We have to be in Him. But this is our potential in Him. That we shall put... Um, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. It's either your hand or your foot that they put on the neck of the enemy and break it. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. So it's dealing with the fact that there is a kingly um, anointing where you'll be raised up. And so, again, uh, we looked at the Nazarite theme. And one of the, the words for Nazarite means to be raised up above the people. It means to be raised up in a place of spiritual authority. That we are raised up to a place that we are not like normal human beings in the spirit realm. Normal human beings do not carry the authority of the sons of God. The authority that we have through Jesus, the Son of God. A normal human being doesn't have access to that. They're not even called sons of God. We're actually told in Hebrews that now in Christ Jesus, as born again, new creation sons of God, we actually hold a position of authority that's over the angels. Like it's like, I, th I don't think most of us are doing a good job at it. I think we still need the angels to tell us what to do. But in Jesus, we're actually over the angels. Now that can't be said of any other human being. Because it even says that in Psalms, it's quoted in Hebrews, human beings are created a little lower than the angels. So these are messianic realities. They're realities for us in the spirit. Now our flesh is another story, but this is who we are in Christ. This is what we have access to, that we can put our hand and our foot on the neck or the head of the enemy, that we will have the enemy's foot, uh, head crushed underneath our feet. There are promises there that we can walk into. Um, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. And so at that time... Judah is being looked at, well, you're not fully matured. You're not a fully matured lion, you're a lion's cub. But in you is the potential of the fullness of lion likeness. Yeah. He stooped down, he crouched down as a lion, and as a lion lioness, who would dare rouse him? Okay, um repeats this later on in the prophecies of Balaam. Gives us a bit more clarity. So he stooped down and he crouched as a lion. This is dealing with he is waiting for his prey. So if you ever see you know those wildlife safari movies, you know the lions, you know, all the real life ones when they you know they, they kill the gazelle and everything like that and Rip apart the animals and eat them and all the blood and guts that goes on. Okay, so you ever watch those shows? Lions crouch down, and there's all the tall grass. They smell where the gazelles are, but they've got to be downwind. If they're upwind, the, the gazelles smell them and run away. So they've got to, they've got to get positioned right in the right place. And you see them crouch. And I, and I saw this lion in this movie crouching, and he's actually... You know, like the soldiers, yeah, you see in the, in the war movies, and they've got their, their guns and everything, they're, they're actually on the ground, and they're kind of coming, like the lion is crouching down, he's coming in like that. So this is like, this lion has prepared himself, he's hunting for his prey. Mm. Very interesting, because when I talk about spiritual warfare, I get in trouble sometimes from different people in the church, because they have a different view to me. They say, oh, you read uh, Ephesians 6, it's all defensive. Weaponry, you know, it's all defensive. Shield and breastplate, and I forget the sword, you know. But anyway, it's all <laughs> defensive, you know, because we never, we should never go out and attack the devil. We should only just, you know, focus on God and worship God and worship Jesus and, and fellowship with one another and read the Bible, but we should never do spiritual warfare. We should not, I don't agree with spiritual warfare. We should never go out there and seek out the enemy, you know. Meanwhile, the Apostle John says in 1 John, 
the Son of Man came to destroy the works of the enemy. Mm. Jesus was sent to destroy the works of the enemy. And also Jesus in Matthew, because we're looking at the line like Jesus and Matthew, in Matthew it says, you know, um, I'm establishing my people and the gates of hell will not prevail against them. Well, gates of hell won't prevail when we attack them. And so this is one of the things is you're on the hunt. We're not just, we are actually saying, where is the enemy active and I need to overcome the enemy. Okay? And so this is dealing with, his, he's on the hunt, he's crouching as a lioness who would dare arouse her, arouse her, wake her up, you know, like um, you, you're going through the Sahara and all the long grass is there and you're walking through there and suddenly you're about to put your foot down and you're real, oh, there is a lioness and she's asleep and I'm about to put my foot on her and you're just like, you don't want to wake her up, especially the, when the lion cubs are around, you know, mm. more than the... The male lion, who will you know totally rip you apart. Watch out when he goes hunting. The male lion, it's the female lions that look after the cubs. By the way, if the male lion's home and you try to get the cubs, you're in big trouble. But the females, they'll they'll they they live to protect the cubs. The male lion, he's out there hunting. He's got to get the food. He brings it in, you know. And they do do some hunting, but they hunt like the squirrels and the rabbits. He gets the big food, you know. And but. Do not wake up the lioness. So it's interesting, we don't just have lions, we've got lionesses, because the Lord is, you know, that there's the sons and the daughters of the Most High God, and, and they were male and female are created in the image of God, and there's certain attributes that are there. And so he's even talking about the lioness's attributes, how she guards and watches over her cubs, and you don't dare wake her up. You... Whoop. Keep sleeping. You know, how do you think the devil, you know, he doesn't want the slumbering church to awaken. Yeah, that's true. Because when we, are, when we spiritually awaken to who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us, which is a central theme of what I'm talking about right now. When we wake up to this and we start to move in the power of this, I tell you what, the powers of darkness, you know, we, we see scriptures later on, talks about us devouring them and breaking their bones as lions. They know who we are more than we know, mm. and they don't want to awaken us. So just keep sleeping there. Just keep mm. and spiritually sleeping, because you can be running after the things of the flesh and the things of the world, but you're spiritually asleep. Don't waken up to who you are in the spirit, mm. who you are in Christ. We fear the powers of darkness. Fear that. Okay. The next verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So right back there, before Samuel anoints Saul from the tribe of Benjamin to be the first king of Israel, right there, the royal kingly scepter was with the tribe of Judah. It was ordained, the Davidic line. God foreknew the Davidic line. He foreknew the Messiah would come in the Davidic line. And there's a scepter that... And each one of us, this is why I said, we are grafted into this prophecy. Mm. That the scripture talks about that we have been given royal scepters. Psalm 110, when the, the Lord Yahweh says, I will stretch forth your royal scepter from Zion. And you rule in the midst of your enemies. And so God, through Jesus, gives us authority. He gives us royal scepters. That we can stretch it forth and we can rule in the midst of our enemies. Now when the enemy is ruling and we are being devoured by the enemy, it's because we're living in flesh. And so our mind is in the flesh, our mind is tuned into the flesh, we're giving into the flesh. Once we turn it around and we start to move in the spirit and understand who we are in Christ, what, how would Jesus react right now? What would Jesus say? What would Jesus do? Once we move into that frame of mind, we move out of being devoured by the enemy to devouring the enemy. The, the enemy comes to steal and rob and destroy. But then we can steal and rob and destroy from him. But we've got to shift out of the, the fleshly person to the lion-like messianic person we're called to be. The Christ-like one. That's another way to say that. The Christ-like one. 
Okay. So the royal scepter shall not depart from Judah. The tribe that we're grafted into is destined to rule. That's why we're told, Revelation, that we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus so that we can rule and reign with Him. Paul says that we will rule and judge the angels. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're destined for, but now this is where, oh, you're just your little cubs now. You know, you just grow up a bit. You've got to grow into the fullness of the lion-like, kingly one that you've been born again to become. Mm. But we need to mature. We need to come out of who we are in the flesh. Okay. Mm. Um, the ruler's staff is another way of talking about a royal scepter. Something like the rod of Moses was a ruler's staff. So the scepter is one thing represents authority. The, the, the ruler's staff, um, if you think about Moses' rod, was a rod of intercession. And whenever he lifted it up to heaven, he was exercising kingdom authority. It's speaking of prayer. It's speaking of intercession. It's speaking of us decreeing and commanding in the spirit. And it's speaking um, of, of our faith focus into God. Our praise, our thanksgiving. So that royal staff will stay there because he holds it. It won't depart from you. You hold it. Okay, it doesn't mean you can't lift it up, by the way. It means that you, you always have it there. And it will not depart from you until tribute comes to you. So it's there until tribute is the reward when you plunder your enemies. That's what tribute is. When a king or an army would defeat their enemies, the kings and the rulers of that enemy people would pay them tribute. That says, you have defeated us and now we owe you. you. We now have to bring our treasure to you. You, you plunder our camp. We have to give you our treasure. And so that's an interesting thing. Because scripture talks a lot about plundering darkness. Plundering the enemy's camp. Mm. What would that look like? Mm. And the enemy goes and gets all these resources for his own kingdom purpose... What would happen if the people of God fully rose up and started to move as a people in our kingdom authority and we start plundering the enemy's camp and all of these resources start to come to us for kingdom purposes? Not for, not for selfish means or not for building our own kingdom. Building the Lord's kingdom. Building Jesus' kingdom. Okay. Um, so until tribute comes to him... And to him shall be the obedience of all people. So ultimately, it's speaking of the Messiah. Every tribe, nation, and tongue will come to him. Every tribe, nation, and tongue will bow. They'll declare his Lord. Even the demonic powers will do that. That is a, that is a decreed, guaranteed end result of history. We're all moving towards that point. We'll be part of it. We'll be coming. But we're not going to be coming as these defeated slaves. We're coming as sons of God. Yeah as members that we actually rule and reign with Him and we share with Him in the victory at the end of the age. Okay. So what happens is, in life, there is the reality of who we are now. And there's the understanding that your hopes and your dreams and different things, especially if we start to get the hopes and dreams of God that He has for us. I'll tell you what, here we are here and it's like, wow, my, you know, the 100 mile high club, you know, like it's really out there, isn't it? So what happens is, the reality of who we are, but the reality of who we are in Christ and who He's called us to be. The further that is, the more stress, stress comes. Mm, that's it. Okay. Now, that's what I call sanctified stress. You've got to sanctify it. Don't get angry at God. Don't get angry at yourself. You know, there's stress there. Sanctify it and turn it into a hunger. I want to pursue that. Now, some people get stressed out. What do they do? You know, it's common. Okay? Read all the textbooks. People that get depressed and stressed, they sleep. No, I'm going to go to bed. I've had enough. I give up. Give my strength for you. You lose hope. You lose momentum. And you go, so what happens? You go into slumbering. 
And when you go to slumbering, you're not moving up the mountain of God towards that goal. Mm -hmm. You start slipping back somewhere. Mm -hmm. Slip back into the valley of, mm -hmm. you know, the shadow of the death. You know, that, that valley. Don't go there. So there's, a, there's this spiritual realities that are going on. But there's a, the promises of God are there. But we have to awaken. We have to arise. And we have to ascend. And that's where it says, the, the lion cub, he goes up. From his prey. He defeats his... I'm not going to let this situation defeat me. I'm not going to be under the foot of the enemy. Stuff that. Um, I'm not going to let the devil destroy my life. Destroy my family. Whatever. I'm going to take authority in Jesus' name. I'm going to turn this around right now. And I'm going to crush his head. And I'm going to actually... I'm going to use the demons as my stepping stones as I climb up the mountain. Because I'm going to stamp on their heads and defeat them each way. Amen. Okay? So there is, there is a mindset of an overcomer. And that the picture of the lion is the overcomer. Okay. So it goes on. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey colt to the choice vine. And he has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. And a lot of that is talking about Jesus on the cross. You know, he came in on the donkey and all of these different things. So um, I don't have time to go into all of that. Uh, side of things. His eyes are darker than wine, his teeth are whiter than milk. So the whole analogy of the vine, the wine, the grapes, and the whole thing of the blood of Jesus, the finished work of the cross, which was a source of victory. Okay, so we've run out of time that my wife just nicely indicated to show me. Um, so that's just the, the first of the Davidic Messianic tribe of Judah prophecies. And so next week, we're going to look at the prophecies of Balaam. And uh, we'll have a bit of a look at that. And we'll go also looking at David and the Davidic. And how David raised up mighty men that took on, took on the Ariels. Mm -hmm. So it says in the King James Bible, it actually names them Ariels. NIV mm -hmm. says mighty men. The word Ariel is actually mm -hmm. lion-like ones. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he takes on the lion-like ones of Moab. So they've got the devil lion thing going on again. Father, uh, I just ask, Lord, that this would be... Lord, we can hear the word over and over again, but unless we apply this word, we're not going to stand on the rock in the middle of the storm and overcome. The storm's going to come and everything's going to fall apart and we're going to get washed away in confusion and chaos and defeat. Lord, I ask that you would uh, help us, remind us, send a, a spirit of remembrance, Lord, especially when we're in a deep, dark place, when we're being attacked by the enemy, it's just like, Lord, you come along by the power of your Spirit and remind us of these principles that we just, um, Lord, just say, no, right now I've got to shift my focus. Right now I've got to fall into alignment out of the old man, into the new man, into Christ. I've got to actually, this is my opportunity for a victory, an opportunity for a promotion. Lord, just remind us of these things because we often forget. And Lord, that uh, we want to thank you for the, the prophetic destiny that is over each one of us. In Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Amen.